I want to read some names to you, names that you should recognize, at least some of them, and I want to see if you can find the common denominator. What is it that these people have in common? Number one, Babe Ruth. Any guesses based on just one name? Somebody yelled out, baseball, in the first service. And I said, actually, no. Maybe you should wait until I'm done. Uh, Because the next one is Eleanor Roosevelt, who was a famous MLB player, but uh, she got cut from the team early on. Just kidding. Number three, Steve Jobs. You know who that is, right? Founder of Apple, recently deceased. Melissa Gilbert, who I think is still living. Anybody know what she was in, TV show? Little House on the Prairie. John Hancock, some of you might remember him. I think some of you were around when the declaration was signed. (laughs) Just kidding. All the jokes are here at the beginning, so get your laughs out. Nelson Mandela, the first democratically elected president in South Africa, helped bring an end to apartheid. Leo Tolstoy, famous Russian novelist, screenwriter, or playwriter, I should say, and uh, philosopher. I read Tolstoy when I was in high school. Nancy Reagan. Dave Thomas, the founder of Wendy's, one of the best fast food places, I think. Edgar Allan Poe, quoth the raven, nevermore, nevermore. Okay, Uh, let me see, maybe one more. Simone Biles, famous gymnast. Okay, all those people, and I'll add one more. My dad, I'll add him to the list. What do all these people have in common? What is it? You guys are real quiet. Take a guess. Adopt it. How did you know that? Who said that? Were you in first service? Did someone whisper to you after? Oh. No one knew it in the first service, and I was hoping to stump you guys. Yes, they're adopted. They're all adopted. They were all adopted. This morning, we're going to talk about being adopted, in this case by God, our Heavenly Father, adopted in, in and through Christ. What does that mean to be adopted into God's family? Why is it so important? And in thinking of these things, I thought of my dad, who himself was adopted. He was left at birth. We don't even know how to spell his biological last name, have no documentation of who his birth father was. So my dad was abandoned. His mother had a lot of issues, and she was with some different men and had different kids with different men. And one of those men turned out to be a good, decent man. His name was Ben Bowers, and he adopted my dad, and that's how I got my last name, which isn't even biologically my last name. Uh, So I'm, you know, on a genealogy, I'm not a Bowers at all. However, I am a Bowers because of Ben Bowers who adopted my dad. He adopted him, and then around nine years old, when my dad was around nine years old, he tried to take my dad and leave a bad situation, and my dad wanted to go. But his biological mom pressed charges against him. The cops finally caught him, took my dad, and brought him back into custody with his mother, and then from there, he was in and out of foster care and dropped out of high school and went down a dark path. And then eventually he met my mom and he had me and then it was all great. Uh, So the point of the story is my dad didn't really know a father figure. And for a moment when he did, it was not a biological father, but an adopted father. And so he loved that Brad Paisley song. Uh, At least half the man he didn't have to be. You know that song about stepdad? My dad loved that song because he had a stepdad who cared about him. Even if just for a few years of his life, he cared about him. Very quickly, I want to tell you, my dad's mother told him that that man died in a car wreck or in a truck accident. He was an over-the-road truck driver for cattle, and it wasn't true. He was alive. He showed up for my high school graduation. He was remarried to a good Christian woman. She's still living. He has since passed, and so has my dad, but she still calls me her grandson and calls my kids her great-grandchildren, and I barely know the woman, but she's a wonderful, sweet, godly lady. God brought that story back to a, a better close, but in the middle of all that, there's my dad who doesn't really know what it means to be a dad, and now he has a son and a daughter to raise, and all he can think is his adopted father, the example that he set. My dad wanted for us what he only had for a moment, to be loved and cared for, to be desired, to be wanted. And I think, as Aaron shared last week and even the week before that I shared with you, this is part of our identity as humans, that we need to be loved, we need to be cared for, There's this deep need within us, and God meets that need, but we don't always have that need met here in the world. And so my dad was was seeking for his kids to have what he didn't have. He tried to be a very good father, and he was remarkable considering the examples he had before him. He's a great dad, and I miss him. 
Well, his dream, once I had kids, was to take the whole family to Disney World. And that's what we got to do this last week. We saved up for three years. And uh, long story short, he died during that time and wasn't able to go with us. So we did it in his honor. And we took my kids to Disney. And something that stood out to me while we were there, whatever you might think of Disney Corporation, doesn't really matter. When you go into the Magic Kingdom and walk around in there, the cast members, the employees at Disney, they say to every little girl and every little boy, are you having a good day, princess? Or hello, prince, are you having fun? And they talk to them like they're royalty. And they make these little kids, there are millions of kids that go through that place every year, but they make them all feel special. They make them feel noticed and loved. And they wear buttons. It was Ada's birthday last week, so she had a birthday button, and every person we passed told her happy birthday. And she felt so excited about that. And I realized that's what my dad liked about Disney. That's why he wanted to take his grandkids where he had once taken me when I was a small child, because he remembered that in that place they feel, at least for a moment, noticed, cared for, loved by their parents who paid to bring them there and took out second mortgage to do it. <laughs> Just kidding. And, uh, and secondly, by the people who work there, who, whose job it is to make them feel noticed and loved. Again, Disney has problems as a corporation, but, but the people at the parks are generally very wonderful people, and they make you feel special. And I realize that's, that's the world trying to meet a need that God has already met. And that's what Paul tells us in Ephesians. By being adopted into God's family, by being brought in through Christ and in Christ, we have those desires met. We have what we're looking for. So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Hear the word of the Lord. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God the Father, excuse me, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purposes, excuse me, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory." This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Apostle Paul is introducing a thought in this letter. The first two verses are a customary greeting. Hey, I'm Paul. I'm an apostle of God, apostle of Jesus Christ, chosen by God. And, and he makes it clear, this was the will of God that I be an apostle. He's not, he's not stating that the church elected him a leader or that he went to seminary and was entrusted with leadership, but rather God chose him. For whatever reason, I have been elected by the will of God to be an apostle, a messenger to witness to the resurrected Christ. And Paul's making it clear already in his greeting what will be the theme throughout the letter, that this is God's doing, that all the good things we have are gifts of God, that he is utterly gracious, that he has lavished love, riches of love upon us and mercy and good gifts. And so Paul begins by saying, I'm an apostle because of God's will, because God wanted me to be. And then he continues and says, to you saints... The oldest manuscripts omit in Ephesus, or who are in Ephesus. So technically, it was a cyclical letter. Later, it was attributed to the Ephesian church, but it was probably sent all around that region to not only Ephesus, but surrounding towns. And the message still remains the same. To you people who are now in modern-day Turkey, but back then it was just the ancient Mediterranean, to you people who are in Ephesus and surrounding communities, people who are beginning to be persecuted, people who have false doctrine creeping into your churches, people who are sometimes sick and tired and lonely and hurting, to all of you, let me remind you who you really are. And then Paul begins what we call a benediction. 
uh, beracha in Hebrew is this blessing. You, you might remember the word baruch means to bless. And the Hebrew blessings that we chant when we do the Passover meal, baruch atadonai Eloheinu melech haolam, that's blessed are you, O Lord, God of the universe. We do that over and over again, and Jewish people have done it for thousands of years. They do 18 benedictions a day if they are devout because it is important to bless God. And so Paul begins his letter with a blessing from verses 3 all the way to 14. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, the blessing that, that Paul gives in this letter. In English, it's several verses long, but in Greek, it's just one big run-on sentence. Paul has one continuous thought, and that thought is Trinitarian because it, it pulls attention to, excuse me, to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's also full of promises about inheritance and adoption and uh, ransom prices being paid and setting free from slavery and, and uniting all things in heaven and on earth. There's all this good stuff in there. In fact, let me give you the major themes for you to think about when we study Ephesians. All of these come up in these first verses. Adoption, and this is good if you are a note taker, you can write these down. Adoption, inheritance, the riches that God gives us, inheritance, spiritual blessings, ransom price, that the blood of Christ is used to forgive sin. Ultimate hope, or eschatological hope, but I figure that was a long word, let's do ultimate. Uh, But it means at the end of days, at the end of time, God will pull all things together and unite everything. Heaven and earth will be united in the person and work of Jesus. It's something we don't think enough about. Heaven isn't clouds where you float around forever and play harps, right? Heaven is a new creation, a permanently perfect creation. It's what God has always intended and he will accomplish because he's God and he doesn't fail. And so he prepares us through this life in order to receive the life to come that will be full of blessings forever. That ultimate hope that everything will be united in Christ is here in the beginning of Ephesians. And it's really the pressure behind or the pushing force behind everything else Paul's going to say throughout the letter. Unity and love, they're, they're mentioned here briefly, but they become bigger, bigger issues in the latter half of Ephesians, chapters four, five, and six you'll see a lot about unity. Marriage is a picture of unity. Slaves and slave owners are supposed to be unified. The church itself is supposed to be unified. All of this will come up later in Ephesians. And then love, of course, is is the theme through all of the Bible. God is love. And finally, God's glory. And so the title of the series that I picked was For the Praise of God's Glory. When I do a book of the Bible, I try to pick a phrase out of that book that I think captures a big idea. This is a big idea. It's three or four times here in these verses, and it comes again later in Ephesians. To the praise of his glory, for the praise of his glorious grace, to the praise of his glory, over and over and over again, Paul writes that all of this stuff that's going on, everything God is doing is to the praise of his glory. You are created to exist to the praise of his glory. And if you don't understand that, then nothing else will make sense. If you understand that you were created for God's glory, then you'll begin to understand that in order for God to be glorified, you have to praise him. And in order to praise him, you have to respond to his blessings. And in order to do that, you have to take time to recognize how blessed you are. And so Ephesians is a letter to a people who need to remember who they are, rather whose they are. To whom do you belong? And what does it make you? to be an adopted child of God, to be found in Christ, to have this ultimate hope of reconciliation and restoration, to have all these promises wrapped up in Jesus, handed to you in this beautiful present, this gift, literally charis or grace, to have God's grace. What does it mean for you? Who are you in light of that grace? That's Ephesians. At least that's what it hopes to tackle. And so I want to exegete the book. Each week we'll pick a passage, we'll move through the book one verse at a time, and break it down. And for the next nine to 10 weeks, we're going to go through the whole letter of Ephesians. That's my hope, God willing. And this week, we're only going to get through the first 14 verses. Frankly, we're just going to deal with this blessing, this barakah, because it's important. In ancient Judaism, blessings are all over the Bible. Uh, We see blessings used for intercessory prayer. We see them used to confess sins. We see them used in every ritual holiday. We talked already about the use of blessings in Passover over and over again. You bless everything on the plate. You bless the wine. You bless all of it. Blessing, 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 blessing. And every time you offer a blessing, you are recognizing God's goodness and grace, his love and provision, his majesty and magnitude. That's what blessings do. And so they have the 18 benedictions 
in intertestamental literature, which is between the prophet Malachi and the Gospels. Before Jesus was born, there were 400 years that aren't in the Bible. During that time, plenty of people wrote stuff down, and we know what they were doing and what they were thinking. And the ancient Jewish people were thinking, we need to bless God more. And so too, we ought to bless God more. So let's pause here and consider just thinking about a blessing before we break it down. Do we bless God enough? By blessing him, I mean praising him and giving him glory for all that he is and does. And the obvious answer is no, we don't do it enough because we could never do it enough. So let's do it more. Just because you can't do it enough doesn't mean you shouldn't bother trying. I could never tell Kylie how much I really care about her, how much I really love her, but I don't stop telling her I love her. And if I did, it would be a slap in the face. For me, she would slap me in the face. (laughs) That's not in my notes. That's a freebie. (laughs) Blessing. We need to bless because we have been blessed. Not just to bless others. That's the Genesis Abrahamic covenant, right? God will bless Abraham to be a blessing to the nations. And so Israel is given that same blessing. You and all your descendants will be blessed to bless. But part of that blessing isn't just sharing it with others. It's responding in kind to God, being grateful and obedient. And so these themes come up in Ephesians. All right, so some things to notice. Let me get a little teachy here for a second. Uh, I do have a few notes. Some things to notice, four things to notice in these verses. First, the phrase, and Christo, in Greek, which is in Christ. It occurs multiple times, verse 3, verses 4 through 6, verse 7 to 9, verse 10 and 12, verse 13 to 14. It's all in there, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. What does it mean? It means that it is all Christocentric. Everything is centered around Jesus. Without Jesus, the whole house of cards falls, right? Everything God is building is built on one cornerstone, one foundational stone. And what is that stone? Rather, who is that stone? Come on, you know the answer. Jesus. Okay, let's try it again. Who is the cornerstone of our faith? Jesus. And so without Jesus, everything else crumbles. It's sinking sand without the rock that is Christ. And so all over we see in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Everything is happening in and through Jesus. The second thing to notice is the phrase kata or according to. Over and over again, it says that things are happening according to. Verse 4, verse 5, verse 9, verse 11, verse 12. According to. It's like a purpose statement. In as much as or because of God's blank. So according to is a way of saying because God is. That's basically what we're saying in English. This is the stuff God is doing because God is rich in grace, lavishing love, merciful, kind, all those things that we read of God in Scripture according to his love, grace, mercy. Does that make sense? So we need to notice all the attributes of God that fuel the promises of God. We, we receive from him because he is gracious in giving. He's generous. He's rich in generosity. He, bless, he blesses us, kathos, because... He wanted us to be holy and blameless. He wanted to set us apart for his good purpose. We'll talk more about that. Third, the the benediction, these verses, has three active participles. Each of them announce an important theme throughout Ephesians. Eulogesos, which means who has blessed. Then we have norisos, which is having made known. And prorisos, which means having predestined. Those are three important themes. God has blessed us, he has predestined us, and he has made known to us. And Paul says this divine mystery that he's going to bring all things together in Christ to complete perfection. So he's blessed us, that we've already said some about. He blesses us in so many ways, spiritual blessings, inheritance in heaven, the the sonship and daughtership with Christ in heaven. All of that is a blessing of God. But he blessed us having predestined us and that word is important, pro because it means he has already decided where we will be before we even get there, predestined. It's literally what it means, to choose the location of arrival before you ever leave. And, and Paul says before he even founded the world, before he laid any foundation, he already knew that Christ would be the foundation. Before he made you, he already knew you would be with him forever, that he would unite all things in heaven and on earth in Christ. So God has already destined what will be in an analogy that's not, not perfect, but decent, uh, I'll use a baseball teams or any kind of team. So a coach, let's just say you have two coaches putting together a team. This is something people debate in the church, and I'm going to try to put an end to the debate right now. 
Uh, so there's no reason to argue Calvinism, hyper-Calvinism, Arminianism, traditionalism, different views of how God elects. How did he choose? Who did he choose? How do we know we're chosen? Those debates are fruitless, and they lead to a lot of division in the church. Uh, we, don't, we don't promote one of those views. We would rather ask you to consider the breadth of Scripture, all that it has to say about God's choosing, predestining, electing, and then consider what the implications are in your life, rather than try to understand God. The early church, they got this. For hundreds of years, they called it a mystery, capital M. And then it was hundreds of years later, people started saying, ah, maybe we could understand God's mystery. Not that part. I don't think so. The way God chooses and elects people, I don't think it's for us to understand. So let's say it this way. God is a coach, and there are two options. If he's a coach and he knows he has foreknowledge, he knows that his team will be the best conditioned team, that they will win every game, well, they may lose every game, but they're going to win the tournament, something like that. Sounds more biblical. They're going to have a lot of losses, but at the end, they're going to win the whole thing. And he can promise that to anybody who joins his team. Then does God have to say, so you're going to be on my team, and you're going to be on my team, and you're not on my team, sorry, before they're even born? Or rather, could it just be that God says, I've destined my team to look this way, to do this, and here's my team manager, Jesus. He's going to keep things going. Who wants to sign up? I think that's a good picture, so that there is still responsibility on our part to receive the grace of God. But there is no grace of God without his gift. There is no team if God doesn't put one together. There is no manager without Jesus. There's no trophy in store if there is no team. And there is no team without God in Christ. So we have to have God move first. He's the mover. He's the first mover. But then he calls on us to respond. And Paul is saying to his friends, to you who have heard and responded, he says it right here in these verses, verses 13 and 14, to you who have responded, who have heard the gospel and obeyed his voice, you are already guaranteed because of the seal of the Holy Spirit, you are guaranteed the championship. It's yours. You join the team, you're on the roster, you're in. That's a powerful, powerful promise. You are guaranteed the victory in Christ. If that's true, and it's one of those things we know but we need to be reminded of, if it's true, it changes the way we play the game if we already know we win, doesn't it? That's why the year of Jubilee was important. I don't have time for this, but I really want to say this. Uh, the year of Jubilee in the Old Covenant, every 50 years, the Sabbath upon Sabbaths, all the, all the debts were released. All the lands were released and given back to tribal ownership. Everything went back to square one, as it would be, as it should be. Nobody ever actually practiced it in human history, but God gave it as an optional thing to do. He gave it as a command, but they treated it as optional. Jesus as we said a few weeks ago, he comes into the temple, he reads, rather the synagogue, he reads from the prophet Isaiah in the scroll of Isaiah, and he says, the year of the Lord's favor has come, and then he sits down and he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. The year of Jubilee is upon you, is what Jesus is pronouncing. He's saying everything's gonna go back to the way it should be. If you know that that's the case, if you knew that every generation things were gonna shift back to the way they were, then what is the point of accumulating lots and lots of stuff if you're just gonna to have to give it all back? What's the point of collecting debts and executing debtors if you know they're gonna be released soon enough? It changes the way we do everything. And so the year of Jubilee was an ethical mandate to help people see that this life is training for the eternity of life to come, that it's not meant, it's not meant to be used for your selfish gain and promotion, but rather to glorify God with your life, to learn how to love one another. These promises are not individual, but they are personal. There is no promise that God will save you, but there is plenty of promise, promises all over that he will save us, and you are part of us, and there is no us without you, and there's no you without us. Does that make sense? If I weren't a son, a husband, a father, a friend, a pastor, I wouldn't be. Those relationships are what makes me me, right? Every part of my life has been defined by my relationship to other people. So salvation is a relationship within, just as God exists three in one. Jesus prayed, Father, as you and I are one, so too let my disciples be one. Let them be one with us. Salvation is that gift to the corporate body of Christ. You have been predestined. We, as the church, have been chosen beforehand and given this promise that we will end up with God forever where all things are united. That is good news. It's good news. And the reason we know is because we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. So we'll get into more of that in weeks to come, but these are all important themes that come out in this blessing. I want to look quickly at the verses themselves. If you would, follow along with me. Verses three through six. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So he's already promised us the blessings in Christ. And then in heavenly places is a reminder that these things are stored up beyond just what is earthly. Jesus talked about that. Lay up treasures for yourselves in heaven where thieves do not break in and steal and moth and rust cannot destroy, right? So... It says, verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So now we reconsider the choosing. Everybody wants to know individually, am I chosen? Am I saved? But Paul says that's not even what we're talking about here. That's elsewhere. In Romans and Galatians, you might be able to stretch that out. But, But here, there's no doubt what he's saying. You are chosen not to be saved. The redemption is is part of the process. But you are chosen to be holy and blameless. Well, what does that mean? Holy means to be set apart, hagios, to be separate, set apart, and blameless. Anybody know where that word comes from in the Old Covenant? What does blameless refer to? Any guesses? I thought I heard crickets back there. Uh, It means the lamb for sacrifice is supposed to be blameless. The word is usually translated unblemished or spotless. It's the same word. But when it's applied to people, which it is even in the prophets, it's often used to refer to moral integrity or blamelessness, uprightness of character. So people who are good people. So to be set apart and to be righteous, or we could sort of dumb it down and say, God chose you before the foundation of the world, chose us in Christ, the church, to be distinctly different, set apart as God is different, we are to be different from the world. That'll come up again in Ephesians when he says not to go back to the ways of the world. Some of you will admit you've done that. Having come to Christ, you've crept back into old patterns of living, old ways, old habits, things that you know do not satisfy, lifestyles that you know are not not supportive of, of eternal life, but rather are sapping your energy in your life that are damaging the love between you and God. You still do it. We all still struggle with this because though we are no longer slaves to sin, the effects of, sl- of slavery are still there. We have that nostalgia for tyranny. The slave driver told us what to do, and it's hard to break that yoke completely and to just do what God says. So we struggle, but to be holy is to be different, to be set apart, and we are called to be holy. And then the other word, which is what we often poorly associate with holiness, it's a whole different word. Holy, hagios, just means different, set apart. This other word is what you think of when you think of holy, and that is blamelessness or moral integrity or unblemished. And that that refers to ethics, morality, being good. So then God set us apart to be different and to be better. To be different and to be better. Not better as in more valuable, but better as in morally superior. To be ethical people. It doesn't just mean you don't uh, smoke, drink, or chew, or run with girls who do. It means... It means you, you seek to do good, to practice justice, to care for those in need, to be like Jesus. When we look at Jesus' life, God doesn't keep telling us, and Jesus never smoked a cigarette, and he never said a curse word. Rather, what we see in Jesus are things that, that remind us none of that is even remotely on the radar because of what he is doing and how demanding it is of his time and energy. Some of us think as long as we don't do some bad stuff, Sunday to Sunday, we're doing okay. But that's not the call of the Christian. It is to be like Christ, to do what he did, not just to avoid sinful bad things. Sins of omission are probably more damning when we don't care for those in need, when widows and orphans are not preeminent in our lives for care and and concern, when we don't honor those that, that have raised us, or when we don't care about the needs of those around us, the poor, the hungry, the naked, the sick, the suffering. To not care for those people, Jesus says in the judgment of the sheep and the goats, he says, by not caring for them, it was like you ignored me. You didn't care about me. That's a damning statement. You cared more about you than you did about me. And they say, when did we see you like that? And he says, all those least of these that you saw, those were me. That's a sermon for another time. But the point I'm making is that we, we are called to be different and to be better, to be good, to be set apart and to be good. We forget sometimes that God has called us to be good. He doesn't call us because we're good. 
Paul's made that abundantly clear. It was his foreknowledge before you were born, before the world was founded, the will of God and his rich will, according to his counsel, according to his plan. There's no doubt this is God's doing. It's not yours. You didn't earn it or do it. But I think we know that by now. We know that. So then what is he doing? He's setting you apart and making you good people. We're so concerned that we don't assume we have to be good people to be loved by God that we stop trying to be good people. You should try to be good people. Does that make sense? God has set you apart as good people. So be good. You don't have to be bad anymore. Jesus has equipped you to be good, to do good. In fact, he says that's what he's called us to do. All right, verses uh, five and following. He predestined us, rather, in love. I don't know why in love comes before the verse. None of these verse numbers were there in the original. In love, God predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Okay, so a few things here. Adoption, in the ancient Near East, adoption was an important practice, but in the Greco-Roman world, the world in which Paul lives and writes the letter, Roman law dictates that an adopted child is guaranteed inheritance. A biological child can be forsaken in the will, cut out of the will, but an adopted child is guaranteed inheritance. Isn't that fascinating? That's from outside of you know, extra-biblical history, but we know that to be the case. Roman law dictates Orphans who are adopted are guaranteed inheritance. So it's as if Paul is not only piggybacking on a concept of being brought in, though we were not biologically in the right place, we were children of the devil, as he said to the Pharisees and scribes. God has adopted us back into his home to eat at his table, to be his children again, as we were intended to be. Not only are we adopted in, but by being adopted in, we are therefore guaranteed inheritance in and through Christ. We share the spoils of his victory. That's in Isaiah. The song of the suffering servant ends by him saying, and he will divide the spoils with the weak and share his good gifts with the strong. So God has promised in Christ to share the victory with you because you are adopted into his family. doesn't matter what your biological family was like, whether good or bad, you have eternal heavenly family. We here are family. We'll see that and feel that tangibly when we come to the Lord's table in a few moments. So then verse seven begins the next section. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So in him, we have redemption. To be redeemed is to be brought out of slavery into freedom, And we know that that's what God has done in Christ. He set us free from sin and from death, from the power of darkness. He has set us free, and he's done it, it says, through his blood, meaning the blood of Christ on the cross, the blood we commemorate every week with the cup. That blood is our redemption. The third cup of Passover is the cup of redemption, and likely the one that Jesus poured and prayed over and said, this is my blood, a new covenant for the the forgiveness of many sins. He was recognizing that redemption is through his blood. God paid a price to set you free. Now, there have been arguments in later church history about who God paid the price to, how much the price was. Was the price paid only for the limited atonement, those who God knew would receive it? Or could the price be paid for everybody and then wasted by those who don't receive it? Who cares? You don't know. We will not know. And when we're there, we won't care anymore. So why bother? What you need to know is that the price was paid The early church seems to be comfortable with a little more vague mystery, to just trust that God knows what he's doing. You are slaves, now you're free. How? Because Jesus paid with his own blood. Praise God. He paid. The price he paid was enough to set all of us free. It was enough to forgive us of our sins. Apparently there were trespasses, and there's no doubt what that means. Forgiveness of trespass means we had wronged God, and we had wronged one another, and we had wronged even the creation itself. Everything is broken, dismantled, disrupted, disordered. And God steps in, pays the price with the blood of Christ, and begins to restore and put back together everything as it should be, including you. We are being put back together the way we should be. That forgiveness the restoring and forgiving of trespass 
is only accomplished through the blood of Christ. There's no other way to be forgiven. And he does, he does this according to the riches of his grace, meaning it's his free gift, and he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight this gift. So it's like Paul is saying, he doesn't just give good gifts, he loves to give good gifts and he lavishes them on you. He gives lots of good gifts and he gives them abundantly. I can't think of any more good adjectives there. So good, a lot, abundant, lavished, whatever. It's good stuff. And then it says he did it in all wisdom and insight, which is a way of saying God, wisdom and insight is a way of emphasizing that God knew what he was doing and had planned to do it this way. Paul is so clear in Ephesians that God has a plan and that his plan will come to pass. He knows what he's doing and he's doing it on purpose. The cross was no happy accident. It wasn't God's last second decision. I can use this to save people. We know that, right? We know the cross was God's choice. Isaiah says it this way. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. Not that God wanted to crush the only begotten son, but that he had planned for that to be the means by which he would lavish richly the grace of God upon us. God knew what he was doing. He had planned it. And so verse 10, as a plan for the fullness of time. So part of the plan is that in due time, when the end of days comes, parousia, the second coming of Jesus, all will be wrapped up in Christ, united perfectly in heaven and on earth. We call it in Revelation, we see it as the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, a new heavens and a new earth to be inherited by God's kingdom people. And then verse 11 and verse 12, in him that is in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance. That's the next section here. We, now Paul is referring to those who have believed the apostles and the early disciples. We have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So Paul says, all of us who believed in Jesus when he was here and right after he left, we are now his messengers because we know this was always the plan, that he would call us, that we would respond, that we would receive this grace, and then we would share the gift with other people. And so then in verse 13 and 14, he wraps it up. In him you also, and now he speaks to you, to all who have believed, to me. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel or the good news, euangelion, the good news of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Who is the guarantee? Or the word is also down payment. For actually, when you buy a slave, you make a guarantee or a down payment. The guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And so the benediction ends with that phrase, to the praise of his glory. Well, it's not there now, but the title phrase of the series, to the praise of God's glory. Everything he's doing is for his glory so that we would praise him. But he ends by saying that you who have heard and believed. And so we have to ask the question, have you heard? Have you believed? Have you obeyed? Have you put trust in Jesus? Because if so, then all of these rich promises are yours in Christ. The ultimate hope is yours in Christ. And that defines who you are because of whose you are. And it changes the way you live. If you know whose you are and you know who or what you are, then you live into that identity. You have to know who you are to become who you are. I know it sounds strange, but if you forget who you are, well, let's use a Disney movie, The Lion King. Uh, man, what a good one. He says something like, Simba, you have forgotten who you are. Something like that. James Earl Jones has a really cool voice. I don't. Uh, I can't even remember what he says. It doesn't matter. It's not in my notes. Uh, but he's saying, you're a king. He's saying, you're a king. Don't forget you're a king. Here's a better one. How about Nelson Mandela? We mentioned him earlier, right? He's one of those celebrities, famous people we know and recognize who was adopted. Nelson Mandela is a celebrity because he was a leader among the people. He wasn't an actor or a playwright or anything, but he was a political activist who spent over 20 years in jail for what he believed was right, anti-apartheid, getting rid of racist politics and systems that were broken in South Africa the mistreatment of people of color. He knew that it was wrong and he stood up against it. He was born in the 19 teens or 20s, I think. He was, he was 95 when he died 10 years ago. So uh, he's, he lived a long life. And in the middle of that, he had tuberculosis, which is wild that he survived tuberculosis. But anyway, Nelson Mandela, he was adopted at the age of 12 by a ward, by 
a fellow chief from another tribe down the road from where he grew up. You might, not, you might not know his story, but Nelson Mandela was born in the line of kings of a South African tribe. Now that sounds like royalty, right? And it is technically royalty, but he was a king of a tribe or born in a line of kings of a tribe that had 10 huts where the women had to walk two hours each way, morning and evening, to get potable water. They ate out of a cast iron pot everything that they ate. It was cooked and eaten out of that pot. That's the wealthy families, the royalty in that village. So you can imagine what poverty looks like there. So even their kings and chiefs were poor people compared to modern standards. The sad thing is, uh, even today, the women in those villages where Nelson Mandela grew up, they still walk two hours each way to get potable water, still haven't solved those problems. But anyway, he grew up in poverty, but he never forgot who he was because the ward who raised him, which is kind of like his, almost like an uncle or something, a godfather who raised him, reminded him regularly that he was from a lineage of chiefs and kings, that he was a man of prominence, that he was meant to defend the honor of the people and to lead them well. And so he grew into a man who knew his identity, though it seemed that he was not. It didn't seem that he was a political leader. Even when he went to school, he went to a Methodist boarding school, and then he went to undergrad, and then he got a law degree. And then soon enough, he, he was an activist who ended up in jail all through his life. It's kind of like a Pauline story, like the Apostle Paul. All his life, he was doing the right things, trying to be who he knew God made him to be, but it never seemed to pan out. And then finally, after he was released from prison, he continued to fight against apartheid, and he was soon elected the first democratic president of South Africa, a black man in a region known for apartheid. Amazing, an amazing story. The story of Nelson Mandela is, is wonderful to read. But it only happened because his adopted father reminded him who he really was all throughout his youth so that he never forgot for a moment who he was called to be. Ephesians 1 is that story for you as a believer in Jesus. It's God saying to you, whatever happened in this earthly life before, don't forget for eternity who you are, who I have predestined you to be, where you will be, what you will be, who you really are. Don't forget that. Don't lose sight of your real identity so that you can live into it. Because unless you remember you are a child of the high king of heaven, holy, set apart, blameless, morally upright, God's beloved ones, if you forget that, then you will never be who you were made to be. You won't be that. And so Paul reminds you who you are this morning. Would you stand with with me as we wrap this up? The amazing thing about this phrase, to the praise of his glory, over and over again, is that that's what happens when someone is adopted. Nelson Mandela had earthly parents, biological parents, I should say, but at the age of 12, he was adopted by another family. And it is that adopted father who is remembered in history, who is honored as the man who raised Nelson Mandela and taught him all that he knew. I can't pronounce his name. It's in Afri- some African language, and I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, you can Google it. But this man is honored in history books because he raised the future president who helped bring an end to apartheid for a whole country. It's that man who's honored. Not his biological father, but this man who adopted him because it was that man who shaped him, who invested in him, who reminded him regularly of who he really was. And so for you, sons and daughters of God, it is God who will be praised and glorified when you live into your identity as his children, when you are holy and blameless when you become who he made you to be he will be praised and glorified and so Paul says again and again to the praise of his glory and so we together say God help us to be the children you called us to be to the praise of your glory